Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Royal Society of Chemistry and our beautiful library. Um, I'd like to introduce you to the Chief Executive of the RSC, Robert Parker, who's going to say a few words about the competition and welcome our honoured guests. Robert. Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome here to the Royal Society of Chemistry's Chemistry Centre um, here in our London office. It's very good to see you all here. First, I'd like to extend a very special welcome and thanks to our guest of honour, Mr. Erasto Mpemba, who has travelled from Tanzania for this event with his wife, Dr. Naomi Mpemba. Also to Dr. Dennis Osborne and his wife, Chris, Dennis was the physics lecturer who wrote the famed 1969 paper with Mpemba. And Mr. Ray D'Souza, who was a technician working with Dennis Osborne on the Mpemba experiment. I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone who has tuned in to watch this event live online. And I'm delighted that several of the entrants are here in the room with us today, especially Charlie Wu and Pohi Chen, who have come all the way from Taiwan. And huge congratulations to uh, Jazz Majivadia Maja and Aeneas Vina and all at Hermes 2012 who launched the Impember Effect competition in collaboration with the RSC last June. Finally, from the RSC, Brian, Victoria, Chiara and most especially Izzy for making the competition the public and media phenomenon it has become. The RSC is known for many levels of support for scientific communication. Chemistry Week, public lectures here in the Chemistry Centre, huge media stories on a wide range of topics, schools competitions like the annual Bill Bryson Science Communication Award, the list goes on. And part of our Royal Charter is to foster and encourage the growth and application of such science by the dissemination of chemical knowledge. So in all things from primary research journals to conferences to education resources to influencing policy makers to public engagement, everything that the RSC does is a form of scientific communication. We're not the first to do these sorts of things, of course. For really early science communicators, you could look just down the road at the Royal Institution and their sensationally popular science lectures for the public in the early 19th century. These were conducted by greats of the day, like Sir Humphrey Davy, Davy and Michael Faraday. The lectures were so popular that Albemarle Street, where the Royal Institution is, became the first one-way street in London because it used to get gridlocked with carriages going to the, the uh, lectures. The most exciting event on the calendar were the Christmas lectures, which were aimed at bringing science to the poor and uneducated in London. They carry on to this day, and although they are now more focused on children, and the RSC sponsored um, the Cambridge's talented communicator and chemist, Peter Wathers, to deliver three spectacular lectures for the 2012 Christmas lectures this, this last year. So in the mid-1800s, when our Royal Charter was drawn up, this is when we fully realised that most that more people needed to understand science than just the scientists alone. Science became part of the government's concern, especially analytical chemistry to start with, as they realised that the public were in danger from dishonest traders. The Adulteration of Foods Act in the UK in 1860 recognised that some professional guardians of the public were needed to stop crooked bakers putting sawdust and plaster of Paris in their bread. Those guardians were the, were the scientists. So it was around this time that the first professional scientists came about. Beforehand, it was the realm of the upper classes, and even perhaps the invention of the word science as we use it. It used to be natural philosophy, and gentlemen studied natural philosophy. And throughout the years since, our democratic process for government have become much more sophisticated. Election issues now include policies on climate change, GM food and nuclear energy. To make informed decisions about these topics, the electorate, the public, need to be well informed and equipped to talk about them. This is why science communication has become such a buzzword recently. 
We've moved beyond the magical bangs and flashes of Faraday's time. Scientists couldn't be, shouldn't be magicians with mystical secrets anymore. They're solving global problems for the benefit of mankind. So now more than ever, we need to bring the public into the debate to get them talking about science, enthused and enraged about science, because now more than ever, it really, really matters. But what does all that have to do with hot water freezing faster than cold water? When we run public competitions like this, we're delighted to see how it gets people talking about science, round the dinner table, in front of the television, down the pub, people start debating and discussing scientific principles. People sit down and think rationally about a problem using a scientific mindset. And it doesn't really matter what the problem is. What matters is that they're talking about it in a scientific way. So we could become comfortable going down the pub to discuss the pros and cons of second generation biofuels for a green economy, or if genetic modification is something we can accept in the UK as India has, or indeed if hot water freezes faster than cold water. There were 22,000 bits of proof that the public cared about this problem. And through technological wizardry, a huge network of moderators, and quite a lot of elbow grease, the Impemba competition team managed to whittle that down to a small number of finalists. So who better to take you through the brilliant and creative shortlisted entries than Jazz and Nias? So I'll hand over to them now. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Jessel Majavadia, more commonly known as Jazz. Um, I'm a PhD student at Imperial College London. Um, I'm studying uh, materials modelling, so uh, a kind of combination of chemistry and physics and, and uh, computational simulations. And this is my colleague. Hi, I'm <laughs> Inia Svina. I also work at Imperial College, but I'm at PhD student in computational nano-optics. Uh, we design invisibility cloaking devices and other cool things that we can do with light. And together with Jazz, I have organized the Hermes 2012 Summer School, which has then also led to this Impemba Effect competition. To just give you a bit of the background story of um, what the Hermes 2012 Summer School is and how it has led to the Impemba competition, I'm gonna hand over to Jazz again, who is gonna introduce the school to you. Okay, so um, a little over a year and a half ago, a group of students from across the London universities got together and devised a summer school for students by students. The aim of this was to marry good science and also good science communication, um, as, as, as Robert has just spoken about. Now, what we did was we brought students from an international background, so um, from every inhabited continent in, in the world, <laughs> effectively. Um, and we offered them one-to-one um, -one sessions with some science masters. So we had four guest speakers who are experts in material science. We were able to then bring them media masterclasses and we gave them a mere 24 hours to have a go themselves at using video media at, um, to communicate some of the science that they just learned. So this is a really, really good way of making sure that what they've learned is kind of sticks and they can actually offer something to the wider world. Um, and oh, um, so as you can see, we had a we had a glorious backdrop, which was also the the setting of uh, the King's Speech as well. So this was Windsor uh, uh, in Windsor Great Park, so it's Cumberland Lodge. And one one the most important aspect of this was that because it was student led and just kicked off entirely by a bunch of poor students effectively. We had no money to our name and it was not, it wouldn't have happened without the a generous donation of the Royal Society of Chemistry. So because of, because of their help, our event could take place, but also 
we were able to offer scholarships to students from developing nations who were able to actually attend um, the event. So, so this is this is our uh, scholarship winner picture with uh, with the, the former head of the Royal Society of Chemistry, David Phillips, um, and in in our collaboration with the RSC, we we. we struck up a relationship with the PR department here and um, were able to start scheming about some, some of our own science activities that we thought we could have a go at. So. so what we really wanted to do is we wanted to run a bit of science communication of our own just to show our summer school participants what we think good science communication can look like today. So what we started is this Pember effect competition in collaboration with the Royal Society of Chemistry. And in picking the Pember competition, we had sort of three overarching ideas in mind. First of all, we wanted this to be a genuine open scientific question. So we didn't want something that has been answered. We wanted people to really think about it and put themselves in the shoes of scientists that we stand in every day. We also wanted it to be very simple so people could actually go to their home fridge and do the experiment themselves if they wanted to. And finally, we wanted it to be very interactive as well. So we didn't just want to talk at the public, but we also wanted to listen. And that's why we invited people from around the world to send in their theories. And they have done this uh, with great success. So we actually received a, a huge amount of attention from, uh, from, from the media uh, community, including the BBC and the, even a leading article in the Times. Um, and this enabled the competition and the question and the, the, the sort of scientific method to reach um, an international audience, which resulted in um, a slightly overwhelming number of submissions. So, in fact, we got about 22,000 submissions in a span of only a few days. And this, at one point, even led to our service burning up. And we had to find some quick workarounds to get everything up again, because people were sending us dozens of submissions per second, and they were just piling up on our service. Uh, but it was a, a great problem to have. And in parallel, we also had a lot of attention on the Internet, so people on various parts of the internet from a car forum where people, car enthusiasts were talking about why hot water freezes faster on a windshield than cold water to people on Twitter who had some interesting things to say so, as well. So an incredible amount of support on Twitter. So um, we received a, a tweet saying the world actually needs more um, events like this and I want to wish luck to everybody and greetings from Turkey. So we actually had quite a lot, a lot of enthusiasm from Turkey as well. So that was great. Um, so then we came on to the, the next part of the problem, which another, another thing that we didn't actually foresee, which was how on earth do we choose a winner out of 22,000 entries? So that was a bit tricky. So, so what we decided to do is to sort of have a two-tiered approach. First of all, we wanted every entry to be looked at by a trained scientist. And that's where sort of the power of the Royal Society uh, came in useful. What they did is they hired scientific experts from their uh, friends that they have as members who looked at each and every entry in detail and scored it on various um, uh, levels and thereby sort of gave everything a, a fair hearing. What we did in parallel is something that Jazz and I were quite passionate about, which is we wanted to open this up to the general public and give everyone the opportunity to act as peer reviewers of these 22,000 entries. So we opened up all the entries to the general public to look at them and act as peer reviewers and say which one they like best. And what we thought was quite neat about this is that it kind of closed the arch of the scientific process. So first we got people involved in actually creating scientific theories, which is something that scientists do on a daily basis. But then in the second stage, we also got them involved in evaluating and sort of looking at the viability of scientific theories, which is what peer reviewers do just before a, a theory gets published. And um, using these two approaches, so the RSC internal judging procedure and the input from the general public, we then arrived on a top 10 list. So one of the, uh, we had to kind of decide on some criteria for a winner as well. So um, what all judges were, were asked to look for is an answer that was 
not only scientifically sound, but because part of the job is also communicating science, we wanted a creative solution, both in uh, content and delivery. Um, so um, ensuring that it's also very well presented. And actually, we're, we're hugely impressed with so many of our entries, and that's what we want to showcase uh, just now. So we received one entry from Daniel Mutakrishna from Queensland um, in Australia, um, who is an 18-year-old engineering student who said that he was so intrigued by the phenomenon that he had to test it out for himself. So a young 18-year-old student um, carried out a whole series of experiments, and his theory was based on uh, one, of, one of the possible theories of convection. So what he has shown um, in, in this graph here, so um, the, the blue line um, shows um, full convection allowed. So he took hot samples of um, water, popped them in a freezer, and he either, uh, like, he either allowed uh, convection to occur or baffled con convection, um, thereby stopping, stopping um, um, heat rising effectively. Um, and what he showed was that actually convection does speed up the cooling process of water. So supporting one of the possible theories. So he came up with that all on his own, which was brilliant. We also had an entry from Pia Piacena, um, who, who, who said, he, I was not aware of the Mpemba effect until I read a newspaper article about the competition. And this seemingly impossible occurrence surprised me and compelled me to find an explanation. The, invest the investigation, which lasted for about one month, was really enjoyable. And what he did was rather than coming up with his own theory or, um, and, and, and writing about it or making a video about it, he took a bit of the science that he knew and he created an interactive program where you can play around with the parameters and actually witness the Impemba effect happening. So that, that's utterly new and that's come out of, come out of this competition. Um, we, we received a whole host of sort of entries from diverse backgrounds, including um, one musical performance um, and one, uh, one artistic uh, video that we'd, we'd like to show here. This is from Alison Bolt, who is an art student in London. Um, and as she says here, without any kind of background in chemistry, she entered the uh, competition to share her ideas. And as you'll see, they're quite sound, so I will play this for you just now. just learned that actually we have uh, Alison in the room just now so can, can you stand up and wave at us all hi <laughs> so 
in fact, we were also really impressed by the sort of international scope of all the entries. We had many uh, entries from all continents of, of the world. And one of them that we want to sh showcase here is this particular one from two young students from Taiwan who have clearly put in a lot of effort into this. It's very interesting from a scientific perspective, this particular video that they have made. And it's also very interesting in the science communication aspect, which is something they went into towards the end illustrating their ideas in a very creative way, which is exactly what Hermes 2012, our summer school, is all about. So let's have a look at their video as well. Hi there, I'm Chao Liu and I'm here with Paul Yishen, my old classmate. Together we will be discussing some opinions to the causes of Pongba effect. While well, these videos' contents have not been proven, it will explain the thought process behind some of our ideas. We find that the breathing process doesn't comply with people's awareness. That like is, the temperature of water was decreased to the breathing body. Then the water molecule from the crystal structure, after the water is completely freezing, the temperature of the ice continues to decline. If you observe freezing water, you will find that the freezing process is not occurred in any way. It always starts from the outer part to the center. This shows that the ice formation and the external cold source are inextricably linked. And based on the perspective of molecular kinetic energy distribution, it is impossible that all water molecules are at freeze point. They must be at different energy levels. Therefore, as long as a part of the water molecules is in particular state, the freezing process is able to occur. In addition, we find that there have been many hypotheses on the internet and trying to explain the PEMPA effect, including evaporation, solubility to defense, law of cooling, and so on. But all of them are still not able to satisfy everyone. The mystery of the PEMPA effect is yet to be unlocked. What are the different of this point of view? We don't intend to discuss the evaporation and solubility, since their effects are too small to make the Pomba effect obviously. Then we are discussing the law of cooling hypothesis, which is now generally recognized. This theory is based on Newton's law of cooling, which shows that the cooling rate of an object is proportional to the gap of temperature between the object and the environment. However, there is also a blind spot in this hypothesis. That is, if this hypothesis is true, the hot water only catch up with cold water's cooling state at most. What causes hot water to go beyond the cold water, forming a colder and faster freezing process? By the way, using an equation without considering phase change to explain the properties of it, this idea is really strange, isn't it? At last part of this video, let's talk about the new model we established. Let's based on collision theory and chemical equilibrium. If the hypothesis let the entire water cross down together and then begin to freeze its warm. How about consider it as an onion with numerous thin layers and each layer freeze alone? And each time point. The water molecule collide called savers, losing their kinetic energy and stay on it. Then the ice layer is formed. Does this model have any advantage to explain the PEMBA effect? If you remember the common collision model in chemistry and physics, it's not difficult to imagine that the water molecules in the freezing process are at different energy levels. If the cold surface is so cold that most of the water molecules lose their energy and form lattes when they collide on it, we say that a reaction is tending to form ice. But the reaction equilibrium and the reaction rate are two independent things. Therefore, though the hot water is not so tending to form ice, the frequency of its collision is much higher than the cool water. This fact causes the freezing rate of hot water is faster than cool one. 
Another common example used to explain the independence between reaction equilibrium and reaction rate is Haber process. Even though the reaction of synthetic ammonia at low temperatures will tend to form the product, we always heat the raw material to 500 degrees rather than let the reaction carry out at low temperature. All right, that was very interesting. And in fact, I understand that uh, Charlie and Koji have actually traveled to London here uh, from tai uh, Taiwan as well. So we would like them to stand up also and give them a round of applause. So, so this particular entry is an excellent example of actually giving the audience a little bit of an introduction into the effect some of the possible ideas and then introducing their own ideas. So that's an excellent piece of science communication. Um, so finally, what we'd like to summarize with um, is just a, a few very brief points. Um, the result of this competition is that we were able to generate 22,000 individual theories. So we probably have one of the largest libraries of and Pember effect theories in the world now, um, and we were able to engage um, the, the, the world in this. So, and we also were able to generate a worldwide peer review system. And uh, that's something that we as scientists are particularly excited about because we're always interested to explore new ways to do science by involving the public in all st uh, stages of the scientific uh, process, both uh, ideas generation, but also peer review then as well. So we, we feel that this is a really exciting area to, to experiment in. And finally, uh, we were able to take a full circle. And remember, we're part of the Hermes 2012 community and a community of students across London who are very keen on science communication. So we were able to offer inspiration, um, not only for, for, for the wider world, but also for back to the students that we work with. So that's a 20 strong team that helped generate Hermes 2012 and also all of the participants who took part and all of the people on Twitter and a whole, a whole sort of a, a network of students have now been inspired with, with this kind of idea. Um, and the result of this is that um, because of the Impember Effect competition and Hermes 2012 and the kind, of, the kind of work we've been able to do by just, you know, thinking outside the box a little bit, collaborating with, with this community, the Royal Society of Chemistry, I mean, we've been able to uh, pull together a group of people to, to run Hermes all over again, which we did not foresee. So now, now there is a network of students who are always going to be there. Uh, working in collaboration with the RSC on competitions, on activities like this. So um, we'd like to thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, and uh, pass us back to Izzy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much to Jazz and Aeneas for that and for a brief showcase of a couple of the entries. Um, now, we've started a trend for getting people to stand up, so there are two more people that I'd like to introduce you to. One of them, who was an office favourite and was featured on our website, is a young man called Zach Smith. He did a stop-motion animation, and he's, at 12 years old, one of our youngest entrants. Could you stand up, please, Zach? Um, <laughs> And I'd also like to get, if possible, Mr. Cyril Diamond Morris on his feet, who at 89 is one of our oldest finalists. Um, we've got a lot of, of other very interesting finalists and guests in here, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce next Mr. Erasto Aram Mpemba himself. He's going to speak to you for a little while with... Uh, Buttings in, I gather, from Dennis Osborne, the professor of whom he asked the question, and Ray D'Souza, who he worked on with the experiment. So if you three gentlemen would like to come to the stage, please.
Go straight ahead, and Temper. It's over to you. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> to excellence, members of the Royal Society, ladies and gentlemen, before I start my story, please, let me thank you and thank the Royal Society of Chemistry for inviting my wife and me to this award ceremony and also earlier for giving me a laptop computer after my laptop had been stolen in my country. My story began back in 1960s in my home region in Tanga, in Tanzania, part of the eastern northeast of the country. That's where I went to a school called Magamba Secondary School for from one, from two, from three, from four, what we call ordinary level. And at that time, 1963, let School formerly was a hotel by tourists. People used to go there and play golf. And it was bought by the mission. And we were the first <coughs> sorry, students to attend. And there were a lot of facilities for the hotel, like refrigerators. Then the students behaved by using those facilities. And the surrounding villages is held by locals who were heading cattle and they were selling milk to the two school students cheaply. And therefore, being learned about that everything you consume hygienically you should boil, we used to boil the milk or water, whatever you have to make for eating, you should boil it. So, we used to boil, put sugar, milk, and the other additives that we find good, and boil it and then put it into the freezing chamber of the fridge. So since we were many students, and every student would like to do it, so the equipment were not enough, I mean the places to put the ice cream. So. The one who wins goes there first, finds empty one is this one, then boils it, make it quickly, and pours it. But some again could not have that patience. They just came straight and saw that is, and then they put it to boil their milk or water or whatsoever. They just put the cold thing into the container and put it into the freezing chamber of the refrigerator. And those who followed the principles of boiling it first were the conditions given by the owners of the fridge, I mean the school, that you shouldn't put hot liquid into the refrigerator. So while waiting that to cool a bit, then to put it into the freezer, that one who didn't boil his wind gets the container. So one Incident happens while he was boiling my milk. A fellow student came and seeing that if he delays the container, I will use it, he went straight and poured his milk into that container. And I told him, But I am boiling mine. Why are you using that container? And said, It's me to use it. It's my turn. Then he said, Look here, my friend. He made a joke to me that I don't have to boil my milk. Even the uh, cows of the cattle don't buy the milk before they suck it from their mom and they never die. So I just put my cold and they take it, the ice cream high cold, they will never suffer anything. So we parody a bit. But uh, another student came, took his ice cream out. When he took his ice cream out, then I got a container immediately put mine and they put mine in and by bedrock we put them both 
the one who was putting his at cold or at room temperature and mine boiled into the freezing chamber of the fridge, he put it at instantly one time. And when we came later in the evening, looking at men, they formed a strong, well, solid ice. His, which was called, formed also ice, but in the middle it was liquid. He started the argument that no, you change. Because yours was hot, had to cool to the level of mine. Yours cannot become better than mine. So you, have, you did do something wrong by changing the containers again. I said, no. Then that is thing, I think, well, my former headmaster is here, but he had left. The teacher of physics, we went to report the matter. And then he said plainly that Pemba was wrong. You cannot boil milk and let it cool faster than the milk that is called, that you put them at the same time. So I had nowhere to go for referee except accept the defeat. Now, time came. I passed my O level to go to high school. At the high school, we started with the chapters like Newton's Law of Cooling. And at that time, I asked my school teacher at Mkwawa High School, formerly it was called St. George, St. Michael, if you might not, but it was called finally Mkwawa High School. Then while telling the teacher, he said, I am sorry, it cannot happen that the hot water or milk can freeze before the cooler one. It doesn't ring into my physics. I tried to argue and said, I did it experimentally and it came. He said, all I can say, you were confused. And I couldn't argue any further. So I, my friends, and when in, I do something wrong, let the teacher of physics used to call me that, oh, I don't wonder, that is in papers physics. So the whole class adapted that. Whenever I do something wrong, they make it, that's in papers, dash, dash, even if <laughs> in the mathematics. So it pained me till I did something bad. I observed some rooms, laboratory rooms, when I don't find teachers. I ran in with my two beakers, like this and this, with the cold water and the hot water, and put it and see, but why that, it happens and people don't agree with me. And eventually, after coming, you find it, the hot one, has got more ice, much better ice than the cooler one. So I told some of my colleagues and we witnessed it. And then we were told since most of the students, when we finish in the high school, they go to the university of Dar es Salaam. That the professor from the University of Dar es Salaam is visiting Mkwawa High School on such and such a day, and the end one with a question, no, is he allowed to ask that professor? And there came a professor called Dennis Osborne to our school, and this is the one. So when he came, he was very open to students, and he said, any student can ask anything he feels he's not happy about what. Then I was not happy to ask my question, but it came into my mind that this from four second school teachers from where I came from said I was wrong. In Mkwawa, my physics teacher said I was wrong. Now should I ask this professor? My mind says yes, this is one who knows more than your teachers. So I 
ask you, Professor Osborne. Now, I think we must actually take over there because yeah. you were um, asking a question. The question you asked, I think it's written down here. We did this last night. If you take two similar containers with equal volumes of water and one at 35 degrees room temperature at that place then in Tanzania, pretty hot, and the other as near to 100 as possible, the one that started hot freezes first. Why? What you wrote soon afterwards was that I then asked you to repeat the question. Yes. Which was a sure sign that I didn't know the answer and hadn't a clue what to say next. But uh, it was a good question. It made me think. And so I said, well, I don't know. I know that in the real world, things can sometimes be quite more, a lot more complicated than we expect. And because of that, we had better look at it and try it. I promised to try it back in the laboratories in Dar es Salaam and to write to his teacher and give the answer as we could find it out to our best. Well, uh, you then conducted more experiments at school and eventually convinced your fellow students and even your science teacher that in fact you were right, but they found it hard to believe. And that happened while I was going back to Dar es Salaam. I had with me Ray D'Souza, one of our technicians. And Ray, who's now the bursar of uh, a university in Canada, Victoria University and the University of Toronto, um, was then a technician. Why were you with me, Ray? I was, I was helping you conduct uh, uh, <laughs> geophysics experiments. We were taking uh, measurements of the Earth's magnetic field, and we used every opportunity we could uh, to load the equipment into the Land Rover and take these measurements. And that was my primary purpose. But I must, I must uh, tell you this incident. I was an innocent observer in the room when Mr. Pemba asked the question. There was a near riot. The other students shouted him down. It's wrong. They it's, were angry with they him. They were angry with him for asking. It was for, dreadful. For embarrassing <laughs> Professor Osborne. Okay. Now, on the way back to Dar es Salaam, on a, in a Land Rover, 300 miles over rough roads, as they were then in Tanzania, um, I thought about this. What could be the answer? And, Ray, I think I shared my thoughts with you. What did I say? You were skeptical, uh, and I was even more skeptical. Uh, that was not the reason for our trip to Iringa. <laughs> uh, but, yes, we, we were highly skeptical okay. that this could happen. I'll tell you the truth. This is my first time to make this public confession. I was quite confident Pemba was wrong. I'm sorry, but I was. It was quite impossible, obviously so, because the one that starts hot has to go down through the starting temperature of the other one, and from that temperature will surely take as long to get to zero as the one that starts there. So it's going to take longer in total, whatever you do. Couldn't happen. So I drafted a letter in my mind to Mpemba's teacher, got back to Dar es Salaam, but I had promised we would try it out. And Ray, rather to his annoyance, I think, was told, you've got to try this out and get other technicians to try it out in the in a refrigerator. Where did you find a fridge? Well, there wasn't a refrigerator with a large enough uh, ice compartment. Uh, we went to the chair of chemistry and said, could we do this experiment? And he said, absolutely not. This is, this is not your refrigerator. The only refrigerator available to us was a tiny kitchen refrigerator where staff stored their lunches and milk. And so those of you that know a freezer about this high will know that the ice compartment is tiny. Okay, okay. So we that was the that. condition. And also, I think you annoyed my rather very, very good chief technician because you were distracting him from other things. But never mind. We went on with this, and as I walked around the corridors of the department one day, uh, two or three days later, one of the other technicians, not you, Ray, came up to me and said, Oh, Prof, we keep trying that experiment. We keep getting the wrong result. <laughs> uh, prof was puzzled. <laughs> and uh, so we mentioned this and said, we'd like to know how Mpemba found it out. We would try to find out the answer. So trying to find out the answer, we got a group of technicians and a group of our uh, students in the university. I think those were then in their second or final year. One of them is here today. Gulam Patel, will you stand up? I forgot to see where you were. Yes, that's right, Gulam. Thank you. So they, in a student vacation experiment, spent one week trying to find out why, what was happening and why, what explanation we could give to Mpemba. And we found out, we thought, the reason for it, simple. Thermocouples top and bottom, 
showed that there was a temperature gradient and other experiments showed that most of the heat in our case was being lost from the top surface and because of that that uh, it stayed hot and the one that started hot when it was at the average temperature of the cooler starter was a totally different beast it had a hot top was still losing the heat much faster by conduction and uh, uh, evaporation because of the convection that had built up this memory of its memory of its past uh, in the water okay I'm afraid I thought I knew the answer. There was a storm of protest when we finally published a paper, and before that happened, and Pemba, you had come back to Dar es Salaam, because we had asked you to come, to tell us how you found it out. I didn't then know about the ice cream making. That was new to me. I was looking at water in beakers, and Pemba found it from this ice cream making, and he only wrote that down because of another confession of mine when he arrived, I was really too tired. I had a headache. I didn't want to spend time talking to him. I was warden of a hall of residence, so I gave him, uh, saw the hall manager. We got him into a student room. I gave him pencil and paper and said, write down how you found it. And that became the first part with the result of our experiments, the second part of a paper we published together jointly in Pember and Osborne in 1969. He created a storm of other publications and protests and letters to new scientists and other things, and it attracted quite a lot of media and public attention even then. And this kept recurring again and again over the years. And then when the web was developed, more and more and more. And then our friends from Hermes who've spoken already found it there. Yes, they thought, this is good. People were not satisfied with the answer we had given. There seemed to be more, and in particular, many people wrote about supercooling, which um, I had then given up physics, and I didn't understand anything about this at all. But they thought just perhaps this might be the reason. Now, I can't give an answer to this today. I can tell you what I think is a possible explanation of the effect. Others may want to test this, but I'll just show you. There's one slide I've got. If you can put it on the, the screen now. Um, I will um, be able to um, uh, tell you about it. But before I do that, I'll explain that to you in a moment. More important than actually what it is that causes this behavior is the lessons it brings us about the character of science, the way that Mpemba was frankly abused, ridiculed, reproached for his ideas, the dangers of an authoritarian, arrogant science, because... The laws of nature, as we know them, and the discoveries of people like Newton and Boyle and Madame Curie and others, are, are human laws. They're not the laws of God that nature has to obey. They're our ideas of how nature performs. And nearly always, our human laws for nature are limited in some way, sometimes actually wrong, and always with difficult boundary conditions and uncertainties. And we need to be quite humble about our science. It's actually more about questioning than giving answers. But here is a tentative answer, as I think it is today. First of all, from the left-hand side to A and B1. The cool starter sometimes takes longer to reach zero because the com competition entrance identified three th meanings for this word freezing. It could mean getting to zero, and that was all we had looked at in our initial attempt to explain this in Dar es Salaam. Down to zero. From that temperature, the cool starter, down to zero. And sometimes, not always, the hot starter froze first. Then you had supercooling. Sometimes the cool starter especially, though sometimes the hot starter as well, would cool down below zero and remain liquid, and then suddenly jump up on a plot vertically and reach zero, so that then a, a chunk of ice had formed. It had formed very suddenly, but because of the values of the latent heat of fusion of water and the types of temperature drop that were, were observed, only about one-eighth of the ice was then water at the position B2. There was then ice at B2, and would continue at zero while the heat lost to the um, environment was actually uh, allowing ice to form, providing the 
latent heat of fusion for that process. And then, if in fact it started at zero, it would take a certain time until all that heat going out had enabled it to become solid ice, and at C, C1, you actually had a continued drop in temperature showing that now all of it was ice. And when all of it was ice, that would be quite good if you were making ice cream. And I suggest, I don't think anyone has actually mentioned this, but that while it's super cooled, in fact, the rate of loss of heat will be slightly less because it's gone down closer to the outside temperature. And in that process, therefore, it will lose less heat and would take slightly longer to start freezing. So I put a point C2 where the super cooled uh, uh, samples would cool down. One more thing before um, I finish. Many, many experimenters said it's difficult to get reproducible results. And this is a warning to anyone who does try it at home. It's very hard to reproduce the results. You need to do hundreds or thousands of experiments to get a good statistical average. And I think there's a reason for that, which I can't resist calling the James Bond effect. The trouble is that the mixture that goes into the freezer gets both, both shaken and stirred, and we want neither. It gets stirred because if you pour water into a beaker, almost always it goes more one side than the other, and it begins to circulate, and we don't know how long those circulations last. It gets shaken because if you pick it up and put it down, however steady your young and uh, unintoxicated hand may be, nevertheless, it will actually shake a little bit. And you don't get the same shake every time. So you get results that are confused by the disturbance. And another source of actual uh, shaking, vibration, is that if you put it into any more small-sized freezer, the temperature change from putting in a hot container will cause the thermostat to switch on and off, and most, if they have a compressor, will go woof, 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 and give it a little jump. So that is how I would now try to explain it to you. Convection, hot top, supercooling, and then the rest. But I'm sorry we're running late. Forgive me. Finish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. <laughs> Can we stay here? So I'm going to ask them to stay here. Um, in a moment, uh, Mr. Mpemba is going to announce the name of the winning entry, and with any luck, we'll go to a live link with them. Um, after that, there'll be a short Q&A session with Ray and Pemba and Dennis, and also with Jazz and Aeneas. We're just writing down the name of the winner for Mr. Mpemba. <laughs> Okay, I hope I have got it right, and if I haven't, I should be ashamed for a long time. <laughs> it's a man called... Nikola Begovic. Nikola Begovic. Say it loudly. Nikola Begovic. Nikola Begovic. Begovic. I'll say this. You say it. Yeah. Pepper will now announce the name of the winner. <laughs> It's Mr. or Mrs. Nikola Bregovic. Mr. Nikola Bregovic from the Slovak Republic. Congratulations, Nikola. Thank you very much. I'm so excited to, to be in the live webcast. Could you tell us um, very briefly what the crux of your answer is, please? Uh, well, uh, I must be most think Dr. Osborne. He put it really, really nicely, and uh, I really believe he's right most of the things. So, yeah, definitely uh, super cooling and convection currents are the main reasons. I believe they are the main reasons for this, this effect to occur. Uh, however, I would add that the spooling uh, happens almost, I believe, in every sample uh, when you cool the water uh, from 
some temperature to below zero or to freezing. Uh, but sometimes uh, you don't see, you don't observe the supercooling. Uh, it matters where you place the sensor for measuring the temperature. So yes, uh, I would like to add also that the effect doesn't occur every time, uh, and it's needed that the supercooling uh, temperature of the hotter sample is a bit lower than the than the cooler sample in the, in the beginning. Uh, in some of my measurements, I even achieved, uh, I believe, minus 12 degrees Celsius uh, before breathing. So uh, the cooler the sample to, to put to minus 12 or even below that, you won't observe the member effect. But uh, to say which will be the, the temperature of supercooling, it's very difficult, almost impossible. And uh, in addition to steering uh, or shaking or making such things with the sample, it depends on the surface of the beaker which is placed, uh, in which the sample is placed. Uh, convection currents, that's the main reason, I believe, uh, that, this, uh, uh, that this effect occurs. And it's very important to realize that the, one of the most uh, interesting um, uh, uh, features of water that it has the an anomaly of being more uh, dense at four degrees than below. So what this makes uh, that the cooler water that uh, goes to the uh, below, so the down in the in the sample, uh, starts rising below four, and this induces much more convection than it would be in any other soft ones. I might add that uh, I am currently conducting more experiments with solvents, so yeah, uh, I'm getting even more and more sure every day that this anomaly water is very important for the effect. Thank you very much, Nicola. And can you tell us a little bit about how you found out about the competition, why you entered, and whether you enjoyed it? Of course. Uh, I found out about it when my friend Ivo, uh, he mailed me with a, a mail saying, this might be of interest to you, and the link to the competition was below. I was uh, uh, beginning to explore about it, and I was really amazed. Uh, at first glance, I thought it might be a scam, so I did <laughs> uh, quite thorough research on the internet about it, but there were too many hits, and uh, eventually I found the paper Mr. M. and Dr. Osborne uh, had written. Yeah, and the same day, I, I think in a few hours or so, I started the experiment. Uh, well, I, I have this uh, luck. I'm a PhD student in the uh, laboratory of physical chemistry in uh, the Department of Chemistry in Zagreb. Uh, so I look around me in, in the lab. It's not all the equipment I need to make first first experiments. And I did it the same day, and I even the effect. I was stunned first uh, moment and uh, beginning to design uh, experiments that would, uh, that would confirm my suspicions why this could happen. So made, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, 50 or so uh, uh, coolings, and in a month or so, with much help, uh, my what I'm into. Then I started writing paper that, uh, which I sent to and participated in the competition. I would now like to congratulate you because when I saw there were 22,000 participants in this competition, I was really amazed. Uh, I might say this is really global. So uh, this, I believe, is really big for science and for uh, making this public because it's really a matter that's actually interesting to everybody. I read a comment uh, on your site uh, that one of the uh, observers said that this was broken. Everybody started uh, convections and the super and there's no dark matter 
or something like that describe this matter. Uh, well, I don't believe this is boring. I think uh, in most of the, the cases, really the most simple, most uh, straightforward answer is the real and correct answer. Uh, what this means to me, so I'm really glad that this went so so global, so public. Uh, all those 20,000 people uh, they were beside me. I don't look at them as my opponents uh, in, in this competition. I look at them as uh, my colleagues and my workers because I believe together, you look at all centuries, there is really uh, a complete answer to this problem. Thank you very much, Nicola. And we also have a tremendous amount of thanks, first to you, Nicola, but also to all the entries, to the Royal Society of Chemistry to uh, the people in Dar es Salaam who did those original experiments uh, long ago, to you and Pemba for noticing something unusual 50 years ago this year, well done, and um, for me also to those teachers and your fellow students who were awkward because I have learned from them about this danger of an authoritarian arrogant science and the need to have a questioning uncertain mind. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, now, does anyone have any questions? Uh, Jazz and Aeneas, could you come and join the panel, please? And I think we have some roaming microphones, so if you've got a question, stick your hand up and someone will come to you. touch with each other, kept in touch with each other since 1975, so we haven't lost touch, which is fantastic. He, he used to live in Dulwich, I live in Streatham, so we used to regularly meet. This is fantastic, Dennis. 50 years of friendship and 50 years of knowledge, and I've even been to his house in Kent and met his wife, Christine, this lovely, lovely relationship. Well, Andre, of course, I know as well from the university days, and it's wonderful to meet up again. Question that still troubles me is when Dennis says, he said, Gulab, you'll be invited there. I said, oh, God, what? <laughs> but uh, has anybody, I'm not, I haven't even looked at one of the entries, but one of the things that was troubling me is that in this modern day, in those days, in the 60s, we didn't have it, with this electron microscope and all the new gadgets available, has anybody looked at the molecular structure at each stage of the temperature's drops? So at 100 degrees, that's the molecular structure of the water. At 20 degrees or 30 degrees, that is it. And as it goes through, and I personally, that's my belief, it's got something to do with the molecular structure, the rate of cooling whether the bonds there are much more far apart because it's much more excited in that state. And maybe when the hot water goes from 100 down to 40, and that starts at 40, it's there. at 40, the molecular structure may not be the same as the original 40 degrees water. Do you see what I mean? That's the question. So um, I, have a, I have a partial answer yeah. to this. So there was actually one entry by some researchers in India uh, which suggested uh, something along the lines of what, what you're saying, which is um, um, the formation of particular molecular structures. So their idea was based on isosahedral structures. So that's, um, God, how many sides is that? <laughs> About 20? <laughs> A 20 sided structure. So um, the idea being that the cooler starter um, is able to form these isosahedral structures whereas the hot starter is not able to form them. Now, the problem with these structures is that they actually delay the freezing process because they form structures of themselves. So stopping the whole system from forming a, uh, an ice crystal. So that's one of the possible suggestions that, that has come up um, out of this competition. And that, and that was a submission from India. Um, in addition, there's some, there's some work that's actually already carried out on ice um, at UCL, do, and yeah, so there's a, a group at UCL that does computational modeling on water freezing and ice as well. So they're looking at this right now from a sort of computational perspective. The big challenge, of course, is that this problem is inherently multi-scale. You have 
spot ice uh, ponds that are interacting on a sort of sub nanometer scale, angstrom scale, really. And uh, that has to be modeled through molecular dynamics, which is one uh, technique that scientists use to model sort of uh, interactions of atoms. But then, as Dennis has mentioned a lot, is there is also this convection current going on, but that's a sort of a much larger length scale. It's a centimeter length scale. And computers today are just not powerful enough to model such big systems. But maybe in the future, we would be able to do that and um, then answer some, some of these questions that you have mentioned. Thank you very much. Have we got any other questions from the audience? Might I yeah. add something to the answer to this question? Oh, yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, actually, uh, the, 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 you mentioned so the, these structures could uh, influence the supercooling temperature. So the, uh, the, the, the temperature at which this, this uh, form of ice cream. So actually, this is uh, involved in this answer that we're uh, talking about, but uh, not completely because it's hard to well, I cannot explain how exactly uh, could one predict uh, these uh, structures and combine them with, uh, uh, with the temperature. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we've got a question from the audience, I think. Um, I was just wondering, has everyone been fastening on water? Have they done any parallel experiments with any other liquids, e.g.? ethanol, benzene, obviously you can't get to a freezing point, but have they determined the pathway of the freezing in other liquids? I looked at a number of the entries, uh, not all by any means, I couldn't, but in looking at those, I couldn't find any except one that did that. And the one that did, actually in a way, rather disappointed me. I thought it was brilliant. It was someone who said, I think this is because water um, actually um, has this maximum, uh, this minimum density at four degrees centigrade and goes to the top. And he said, gallium has a similar behavior. And he tested this for gallium and found the same effect. And he said, it's therefore because of that. But in fact, he didn't test it for a liquid that does not have that anomaly. And I, I only hope that some people will. Well, it seemed to be the Seem to yeah, be I, I quite agree thing with you. I, I, the out. trouble is that <laughs> one could go on with hundreds more experiments. Now, I'm not sure that it's worth it, because I think that the basic thing is that we've got to learn more about our scientific understanding of things. This is where I put the stress. And I don't think there's much to be gained by too many more details about uh, why it freezes first. But there's one more thing. One a person who put in a, an entry, and I cannot remember now who it was. I think one with a big search, one might find his entry among those on the web. Um, one of them said, um, if I use a certain process, um, I find that, in fact, the freezing of the water gets speeded up tremendously. And this, he said, could be patented as a way of making ice cream more quickly and therefore more cheaply. But he's not going to do that. He says he's actually going to register his discovery of it so that it cannot be patented by somebody else and exploited. And his aim is that one of the by-products, one of the side effects of the Impemba effect, should be cheaper ice cream for all. <laughs> Thank you very much. And sorry, might I again add something? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, after this contest uh, was complete, uh, after I sent my paper, I uh, was intrigued uh, still, and I started uh, doing experiments with other solvents. So uh, till now, I have managed to, in, in collaboration with my, one of my students, do uh, almost thorough experiments with um, with the uh, 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 third bottle. And actually, there is no Pemba effect, and I believe uh, this is mainly because there is no maximum of density at, at any any point. So, yeah, it's it based pretty much according to Newton laws of cooling, and I believe uh, we will have even more results soon about it. Good, good, good. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. I think we've got time for one more question, perhaps. Yep, right at the back there.
I was actually just wondering, has anyone tried it with natural water or pure water? Because impurities in tap water may differ slightly with the chemicals that they use. Say, when the water flows through the pipes, it may get them from older metal pipes. And the way they clean the rainwater from the reservoirs, it reduces chemicals into the water. So I was wondering if anyone had actually tried it with proper pure water. Yeah, very, very good question. Yes, it's been tried with deionized water, pure water, tap water, and one person on in a paper that's on the web, it was there before this uh, competition, said that he'd tried it with dirty water from the Swanee River in Perth and always, <laughs> always found the same effect. But it's a good question, and actually some people think that uh, dissolved gases and these things do account for some of the problems with uh, reproducibility or lack of it in the results. Yeah. One, one, of the, one of the possible, uh, one of the suggested answers at one point was uh, the idea of defects in water um, acting as points yes. in the liquid that um, start, the, I start yes. the nucleation of ice. Yes. So ice doesn't just happen, it sort of grows. Mm -hmm. So the more places you have for it to grow, the, the more quickly it will happen. So that's one of the possible uh, suggested solutions. So, um, and that can obviously be tested by putting things into it. Yeah. We, we, we did that experiment uh, uh, in the early stages of, of this process. Uh, we did use uh, deionized distilled boiled water. We, we even used uh, water that was distilled by a solar still <laughs> on the roof of the physics building in Dar <laughs> That was another one of our projects. The results were always the same. Yep, one last question. It may be stupid because I'm a non-scientist. I wonder, as this experiment on the behavior of water being carried out not on a hot sample, but by what our professor mentioned, and which I mentioned also in my entry, and that is, never mind the hot water, what about a thoroughly shaken sample how does that behave when you put it in the fridge compared with a still sample? Yes, yeah, so in fact, we had one yeah. entry that, very good question, by the way, we had one entry that examined just what you asked about. Yeah. And this, this gentleman actually found that if he had stirred a sample before putting it into the fri fridge or freezer, he would freeze more quickly. And um, he showed this for a range of temperatures always for most of them observing that the convecting sample that was stirred before putting it into the fridge would freeze first. And as Dennis has said, in the hot uh, water there is more convection currents and that could be one explanation why the hot water actually does freeze first. Yeah. So you have a very good intuition there, I think. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, panel. Thank you very much, Nicola. Congratulations again on winning. And um, I'd like to close now with some comments and thank yous from Robert. <coughs> Thanks, Izzy. It's been great to hear that very personal story from Pemba, and it's, I'm sure it will inspire many people, hopefully a lot of young people, to think very carefully about the things they're told by teachers and uh, to have a healthy scepticism about what they're told, which I think leads to a lot of creativity. Thank you very much for that very personal story. Um, I'd like to thank all our honoured guests and Pemba and his wife, um, Dennis and his wife, Ray, um, Peter Temu, who helped us get in touch with Pemba, Jazz and Aeneas for all their hard work, the RSC media team and Izzy especially, um, and members of the RSC staff who volunteered their time going through some of the 22,000 entries the panel of expert judges who assessed all the entries that made it through to the final round, and last but not least, everyone who entered the competition took part in the voting and the debate. I hope you've all enjoyed this event and experienced the excitement that it's produced, and I'm sure the Impember effect will carry on inspiring people for a long time. Thank you very much.